Good morning and good afternoon and good evening wherever you are dialing in from today. Um, welcome back. You have made it to day three of Invented 2021. I'm so glad to have everyone back today. Um, our Inspire programming ended yesterday, so we have the day all to ourselves um, and just incredibly excited to, um, to move into the session. Um, before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to the group who joined us for the um, virtual escape room last night. Um, David, I saw posted a picture of that in the activity stream. Um, you can see if you go to town hall, um, it was um, it was an absolute hoot. So, and we made it out alive. So you'll be happy to know um, the um, the two dozen or so folks who joined us are all with us again today. Um, so um, thanks again for joining for that if you were able to. Um, I also want to just do a quick pulse check. How is everybody doing? Any stamina left? It's Thursday. It's been a packed couple of days. Feel free to drop a note in the chat um, in Attendify um, and, and let us know how you're doing. And if you, uh, if you need an extra cup of coffee today, we'll try to match your, um, your, your level of energy today and keep it going. So um, really, really glad to, um, uh, to have you with us over the course of these three days. Um, I want to um, spend a little bit of time looking ahead at the work that um, we're going to be doing together today. But before that, um, I'd love to hand over to um, Aaron Toshin to do a little bit of a recap for the last two days that we spent together. Aaron. Thanks, Corey. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to see all of you again. Um, so yeah, I'll keep my comments really brief. And, um, you know, I've done a little bit, I've had a little bit of time to do some reflecting over the last uh, couple of days of conversations. And, um, you know, a number of you may may remember me from sort of years ago now in invention education. And um, sort of in between the time that I was at Lemelson and now have, have come back to work with David on Invent Ed. I spent some time in international development as well as in higher education. And it was all, you know, good, good work. Um, but it's been since coming back into invention education that I'm really reminded how challenging this work is, but how uniquely inspiring this community is. And, um, you know, the convening has received some feedback on, on past convenings um, that, that conversations really haven't sort of turned into action, into sustained action. And so it was really exciting um, to see the number of volunteers that signed up for conversations, to continue conversations on the four bucket areas or the four pillars. Um, and, uh, and to really question if those are even the right sort of focus areas. And so I think uh, Gina is gonna load into the chat the uh, two Padlet links. If you participated in the network parties conversation yesterday, and, um, or even if you didn't have a chance to participate and you wanna go check out sort of what the group came up with and add to it, um, or if you thought last night, hey, I'd like to actually like join, you know, that group to continue the conversation, you know, feel free to click on those and, and um, add your name and add your thoughts. Um, so let's definitely keep that conversation going. And, you know, we really sort of appreciate the, the pushback and the suggestions um, on how to take, how we approach taking equity and justice conversations into, into real action. Um, and if something, you know, doesn't seem right or seems to be missing in the network, you know, let's, let's work together to course correct. Um, and I just wanna give, you know, a quick sort of call out to the two pre-convenings that we had before this main session started. Um, so there was a pre-convening for in-school educators, the very first one, uh, and there was a pre-convening for the research working group. And those are both just really great examples of um, volunteers moving conversation toward action. And um, it's not insignificant because everyone is really busy, right? I and mean, it seems like we're, we're busier now than we were even before the pandemic, which seems like impossible. Um, but, you know, it's, it really sort of, these groups sort of exemplify the commitment to bringing their assets and resources and experiences to helping each other out um, and 
I think that's really sort of what we started here this week and what I you know, plan to keep rolling throughout this year. Um, so I'll just kind of stop there, but um, I hope you'll join us at the close as well. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about sort of next actions, immediate next actions for all of us to take, and then teasing out a little bit more information on the action grants, the upcoming action grants. Um, so I will turn it back to Corey. Yeah, thanks, Erin. Thank you. Um, I'm loving what I'm seeing here in the chat. So um, we have Tony just put on a pot of coffee um, to get him through the rest of the afternoon. And Leslie is going to the kitchen now to do the same thing to get through. Um, I'm going to shout out Leslie specifically. She knows everybody's tired. It's been a long couple of days, but I want you to um, show up and support your fellow network members. Um, please do um, make sure to head to the breakout sessions um, at the um, after our plenary today. Um, our breakout leaders have put a lot of work into them and they're gonna be fantastic. So um, Leslie, we wanna report back from you afterwards to see if uh, if we're able to uh, get folks through. So maybe two, two more cups of coffee today. Um, Lee, thanks so much um, uh, about your comment about Dr. Jones Davis and Dr. Croak. Um, it was a really great way to start yesterday. Um, we feel incredibly lucky to have um, had the opportunity to hear from Dr. Croak and to have had such an extraordinary moderator um, in, um, in Dorothy. So um, that was fabulous to see. Um, one last shout out. I love the conversation that's happening here. Um, Ethan, thank you so much for starting that with me and Joyce. So these are again, those great um, inflection points where this network can come together and collaborate to um, either exchange information about what resources exist, or as Aaron mentioned about the action grants to potentially come together and create new solutions or create new opportunities together. So keep that chat going um, and, um, and really um, excited to see the connections flying here. So a quick preview of how today is gonna go. So we have a really fantastic session coming up um, right after this with the um, uh, Sharon Klotz and her team from the Lemelson's Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. Um, and that will be an interactive session um, uh, focused on um, uh, invention catalysts and how we can become or um, remain strong invention catalysts as we go forward together. Um, we'll do some brief closing remarks after Sharon's session, and then we'll, uh, we'll push you straight off into the breakout sessions for the close of InventEd 2021. So um, you've got a sense of how the agenda is gonna flow. Um, and let me just kick off um, with a little bit of an introduction to Sharon and um, how we were thinking about this session as we started talking. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about this session is that we started off this week with a really big meaty topic um, in racial equity and justice and in the in the conversation with Dr. McGee um, that really provoked a lot of thinking about what our own um, uh, individual um, role is in that. And over the course of the last several days, we've been able to really begin to tease apart different elements of that conversation and take it from this big, um, like big critical idea into some specific um, practices um, for ourselves or for our organizations. Um, I love the fact that we're going to be able to end the session on um, the plenary part of the session in a similar way. Um, the idea is that Sharon and her team um, are going to bring to us in this start off with a big idea and give us an example of, um, of how, um, how we might um, engage in this. And then um, they're gonna take us through a series of breakout sessions that let us put this work um, to practice. So um, without further ado, Sharon, um, I think we are ready for you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. It's fabulous to be with you. So yes, my name is Sharon Klotz. I'm the head of invention education for the Lumsden Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. Um, we're housed within Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. We're named in honor of the inventive legacy of Jerry Lumsden, the same Lumsden that's in the name Lumsden Foundation, for whom we thank for hosting 
this week's convening and for building this community. Um, as many of you know, Jerry Lemelson was a prolific inventor with over 600 patents, and he believed invention is a path to creativity and success for everyone. And he meant that individually, in our communities, and collectively as a nation. Um, we do that at the center through exhibits, public programs, a hands-on invention studio, our Spark Lab within our museum and also at network sites around the US and through uh, research and archives um, by collecting, preserving and sharing the stories and the artifacts of inventors and inventions. And our emphasis has been on a marginalized, surprising, um, hidden and often erased inventors. And these are the stories that break the stereotypes of who is an inventor, what they might look like and where they might come from. So with that backdrop and with the momentum and the authenticity we've all experienced in these two days, I am totally honored and excited to introduce our panelists for today. Dr. Joanna Garner is the Executive Director of the Center of Educational Partnerships at Old Dominion University Center in Norfolk, Virginia. The center develops, implements, and evaluates educational programs with a particular focus on historically underserved groups in STEM and computer science. And before that, Joanna was an assistant professor of psychology at Penn State University, Berks College, an instructor in developmental pediatrics and learning at the Penn State College of Medicine, and vice president for program development at Lab Learner Science Education. She has a bachelor's and master's in psychology from the University of Surrey in the UK and a doctorate in educational psychology from Penn State University. Her research includes a novel approach to thinking about identity using the language and the math of nonlinear dynamic systems to model identity using complexity theory. And one of the powerful implications of this approach is the idea that identity is flexible, it's adaptive, it can expand based on new thoughts, new assumptions, and new actions. Our second panelist is Dr. Kelly Hart. Kelly went from being a serial dropout to being a beyond beloved educator. She's driven by her desire to educate and mentor high school and adult learners of color and learning disabilities. Kelly is a true inspiration and role model, both for her students and for us as education peers. She freely shares her own experiences dealing with parental abandonment, homelessness, and serial expulsion from school. She eventually earned her GED through the Job Corps program and from there went on to learn a, earn a bachelor's in psychology from Virginia Tech and a master's in special ed and a PhD in higher education from George Mason University. In the classroom, Kelly cultivates a learning environment where students are encouraged to support one another, to show and share vulnerability, and strengthen their connections to STEM and their college aspirations. In 2013, Kelly received the Horace Mann Award for Teaching Excellence. This is an award given to only five educators across the entire country. And she won the GED Testing Service Cornelius P. Turner Award for recognition of outstanding contributions to education. She now serves on the board of the GED testing service, having direct impact on the very test that helped her reinvent herself years ago. Dr. Ty Grandison. Ty started his career as a software engineer in Jamaica. He has a bachelor's in computer science and economics from the University of the West Indies and from the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine in London. He has a master's in software engineering and a PhD in computer science. Ty is an IBM master inventor, a AAAS Lemelson inventor ambassador, a distinguished engineer of the Association of Computing Machinery, a senior member of IEEE and a fellow of the British Computer Society. He's authored over 100 technical papers and has contributed to 47 patents. He currently serves as Chief Technology Officer for Innovative Startups and Venture Capital Funds, including the Telehealth Market, M Street X, and Pearl Long-Term Care Solutions. He's Board Chair of the Data Driven Institute, a public health nonprofit. He's co-founder of the Human Collaborative and co-chair of the Seattle Human Rights Commission. From this broad vantage point, both within and outside governmental systems, nonprofits, startup incubators, and education pipelines, Ty now focuses on culture change, creating high trust, inclusive, diverse teams that in his words, prioritize psychological safety 
as a baseline for shared vulnerability, exploration, and collective inventiveness. So one note, and then we're gonna dive in. Welcome and thank you for the conversation we're about to have. With limited time on the, uh, with our panelists, we are gonna invite all of the participants to please chat, share your observations, thoughts, questions. We will be using that um, for the next part of the session when I will welcome my colleague, Emma Gran. Um, for now, we're gonna dive in. And Kelly, I wanna start with you. So one of the most moving parts of your story, I think is the moment when your coworker, and when you're part of the job corps, you tell a fabulous story about how your coworker noticed that you could draw. And she said, hey, you should take a class at the community college. And you said, uh-uh, education and I are not friends, we are done. And she tricked you. She told you you were going out or going to work. She picked you up. She drove you to the community college where she had registered you and herself and you took the course together. Can you share with us, A, how that experience felt to you and how that may serve as a seed for the ways you've paid it forward many times over? Yes, thank you for that. And uh, I still think about uh, Carla, that's where her name is and I'm trying to find her and it's been over 20 years now. Um, but because of my background, um, which was something I thought was normal, especially the area that I grew up in. Um, education, you know, not a priority and usually just getting a job. So I had that job at retail. And after, even after receiving a GED, I still didn't feel, you know, I was a college material and I was just fine working a, a retail until she had brought me over to the college. And even as a student there, like that first term, just taking an art class and then eventually moving around into STEM and becoming a teacher, um, still feeling inadequate because I felt that there was not a place, you know, for me, especially with a you know, different background, so to speak, um, until mentorship happened to come along. And that with my friend Carla, who started mentoring me, and then some of the, you know, the faculty at the college started mentoring me and helped me to realize that one, hey, I'm pretty good in math. And then two, that um, I could become an educator myself. And that stemmed onto uh, me wanting to, uh, you know, bring others with me. It's the whole pay it forward story. And that's what keeps me going. Great, that's so powerful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And, and Ty, one of the things you've said that, that, that has stood out is this idea that you are the sum of all your private prior experiences, including the pitfalls and the challenges. And as, especially given what, what Kelly just shared, I wonder, can you elaborate on that and talk about the role others have played in getting you through, over, under, and around what have been and felt like obstacles for you. Yeah, so if it wasn't for my family and friends, like I wouldn't be in the position that I am right now. Um, it's, it's a statistical anomaly that I'm here in this spot and one of my like 10 friends from primary school are not, you know, either, of, of the 10 of us that I was actually close to, like five have, have died, three are actually unemployed and God knows where the other one is. So, you know, if it wasn't for a mother and father that, that emphasize that, you know, I was worthy and I can actually achieve whatever I want. And if I want to achieve things and um, get further in life, it was gonna be through education. And, you know, no matter where I am in life and what I'm doing, like the responsibility to actually reach back and to mentor and to bring people along, like that was just built in. That's just what you have to do. That's a part of the responsibility of, of, of achieving, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I mean, and, and that's, that's the reason why it's like, it's critical to have people that, that believe in you, that see past like your, all your deficiencies slash flaws and actually push you to be better. Now, well, a quick follow-up for you on the idea of psychological safety and why you see that as so critical. Yeah, um, so psychological safety is the feeling or the context or the environment where, you know, every single person, a team or group 
feels that the environment is safe enough for them to actually fail, for them to ask for help, for them to be vulnerable, right? And in that environment, you actually get the entire collective, the entire team actually learning and becoming better and more productive, as well as actually creating like real bonds. So, you know, throughout my career, I've actually worked for really horrible bosses and with horrible teams. And, you know, throughout all of this, I kept recognizing that it was always with the fact that they're operating in a mindset of, you know, something is wrong, it's punitive, you know, don't even show it, go and fix it. And until, you know, I, I actually had the power to create my own teams and started reading up on actually what makes good, solid, high functioning teams, like it just didn't stop for me. So I, psychological safety for me is just like the basic tenet for any team I'm building, because that's exactly what I wanted when I was actually coming up in my career. Great. Thank you, really insightful. And that's a great segue to the question I wanna to pose to you, Joanna, about the conditions and baselines for identity perturbation, as it were. Um, what's the advantage of seeing identity in through the lens of complexity theory and as a dynamic system? And then more directly to your experience, in what ways have you powered and reinvented yourself? I know, we, we know that you were kind of a pioneering um, woman going on to higher ed in a family where only boys were supposed to do that. So say more about how your work reflects and connects to your personal story as well. So um, thank you, Sharon, for the opportunity to participate. Um, so I'll actually kind of flip those questions and maybe address the, the second one first. So I think what this speaks to is how invention and reinvention uh, can be very personal journeys that we all go through, right? The stories that we've been hearing over the past few days um, are about invention and reinvention of the self, as well as invention of products and ideas and designs and uh, other material ways of changing our world. And so one of the reasons that, um, you know, I'm interested in this is because we are, you know, exploring our identities throughout lifelong, a lifelong journey, lifelong processes. And so everyone has these sort of moments and of, you know, tremendous change and then periods of, you know, what we may think of sort of accretion rather than this sort of big significant tidal wave of change. Um, and you can actually model those heuristically as well as conceptually methodologically through the lenses of complex dynamic systems. So one thing would be to see this process of invention as being a lifelong process. It's a continuous process. Um, another thing would be to see us being nested within systems. So you can think about us having multiple identities as individuals. Each of those can be a system, but we are also, as a person, we are within a social system, right? Or a, an immediate social system. And then we're also within a, so a sociocultural and societal system, right? So, um, all of those are sort of have these reciprocal relations among one another within individuals and then between individuals. And so one of the things I'm interested in is how can we perturb those systems in, inside of ourselves in order to reach new um, periods of stability or new sort of emergences such that we can have these new inventive identities. So, Kelly, I have a follow-up for you and Ty, a follow-up for you based on how Joanna just laid out the idea of perturbing and changing this system that we are, are in and co-create. And Kelly, as you hear that, how does that show up in the classroom? And Ty, how does that show up in our systems and in our invention ecosystem? Well, I work with um, adults and um, high school students uh, that are underrepresented and uh, underserved and encouraging them to go into STEM is very difficult because it's never been approached before to them, you know, and especially the population uh, uh, pretty much grew up the same way I did and I was never encouraged to do so. So it's, 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 it's hard, you know, difficult to see it in a classroom until they have that self comfort and the mentoring ship is very important. And just like uh, what Joanne was saying, the internalizing it and realizing that you can, and also looking at invention as more than creating 
a, an, an item or a project or something. Um, and so once that, uh, that um, comfortness develops, and then you're able to move in the conversations in the class or about, hey, what about this idea? Or what about this? And then, and, you know, the students, you know, the adult ed students start seeing themselves as something more. And a stereotype too with the, the inventions, um, the idea of invention or even the idea of STEM in an adult education classroom, especially adult educations who are working to get their GED, is the fear of the math and the science part, as we know. And then, uh, so overcoming that hurdle. And I think the biggest challenge with incorporating that more diverse, that more underserved uh, community is recognizing the faults that are already there, the cracks. And the cracks are, you know, the math and the science uh, understanding part, and also uh, a big significant part are learning disabilities within these populations. And so, you know, having a math learning disability or a reading uh, disability, just like I had uh, thought that I wasn't good enough to do it, and I have a math disability and became a math teacher anyway because of it. Um, and then encouraging in that matter of, of basically saying it can be done and you can do it by taking different routes. Everything doesn't have to be exactly the same of how you um, invent. One um, quick PS before, before you answer Ty, one quick PS for you, Kelly, in that arc of being a role model and helping to lay the foundation for those transformative reframing of your students in their own eyes, how significant is your own story. I think you shared that there were times when you didn't share your story. And then the moment you did, you realized that that was part of the lever of change for you. But before we yes. move on to the systems, can you say a little more about that? Yes. Um, again, when becoming a teacher, my self-confidence, you know, grew. And I just remember sitting in the parking lot the very first day of my teaching assignment and not wanting to share that not actually wanting my coworkers to understand, hey, I didn't really graduate high school, because even though I'm you know, afraid of the stigma, you know, of, of being some, someone that is less. And so I felt that within my uh, students, the K through 12 students, or it, even still with the adult students, of not uh, feeling that they are worthy, one, of being able to do these things. And then also, uh, you know, uh, because it was never encouraged to them before. And that is the reason why I developed a mentorship by putting out there, you know, where I've been. And, um, and now I blurted out everywhere because I realized the significance of that to where, you know, you know, we've all heard that someone that looks like me. And so now I go even deeper with that. Someone has the same experiences of me. Someone who thinks like me is still part of that, um, that group of mentorship that allows, uh, uh, myself and uh, my students to um, become who they are naturally without fear. Awesome. And you've got the t-shirt to show for it. And I Hi. love that t-shirt. I so want that t-shirt. Um, so I love the way like Sharon and Joanne and Kelly that you've all framed it. And like the phrase that stuck out to me was a system that you are, that you are in and that you co-create. And that is actually very powerful and very telling. The fact to think that, you know, you are a part of the system when you're co-creating it, because for a lot of people in the system, we don't think we belong. We don't think we have an active part in co-creating. So um, how this identity shows up in the system is just like there are, like Kelly just said, there is the imposter syndrome. There is this idea that there is a bar that you have to reach over to actually be an inventor. There is a perception that math and science are the only ways to be inventive. You know, the, the system that we're actually in is a part of the problem. The system that we're in is saying to us, to some of us that, you know, you are not worthy to be here and that you are not actively co-creating. Like it took the, Patent and Trademark Office like multiple years to even list a black person as an inventor, right? Uh, the fact that we're having these discussions is hopeful, but I think at the very core, we have to actually change the notion and the people that we're interacting with to say, invention is the act of solving a problem with constraints creatively. That's all it is. If you want to put like a PTO bar on it and say it has to be novel and obvious, yada, 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 
Or if you want to put a Lemonson or a Smithsonian bar on top of that, great, that's your business. But, you know, by the very fact of actually like being born and living, I'm pretty sure you're doing something that's creative and it's not going to involve math or science in most cases. So it's tied in, <laughs> in, in, in your work, in your work to cultivate a more inclusive, expansive, egalitarian, creative and emergent invention ecosystem. What are the levers you see as being critical for all of us in this invention education sphere to be looking at and thinking about and advocating for? It's the assumptions in the, the materials that you're actually teaching, like that's the first thing, and the assumptions in the students that you are teaching. So like check your assumptions, make sure the content that you're showing doesn't have like a bar or a bent or makes assumptions about the inability of a particular group to invent or not invent. Um, and you know we all have biases and prejudices like check yours to make sure that you're not putting them on your students like that's the the first thing and i mean it sounds easy but it's very difficult like treat people the way you'd want to be treated or the way you'd want like your son or daughter to be treated like, joanna go ahead i i see you formulating <laughs> some like, thoughts and response thinking, please but um so I, what you were saying, Ty, um, just reminded me that oftentimes in education, especially when we're thinking about these ways that we sort of carve up populations of students and educators, that we take a deficit-oriented approach in mm -hmm. trying to address or fix an issue. And there's, there's so much to be gained from a strengths-based approach. And we've seen this in different disciplines across you know, educational research and, and different programs that have been developed. Um, and that might be on a, on a collective level of seeing uh, the strengths in the population, but we also have to see the strengths in the individuals and help the individuals to see the strengths in themselves so that they can engage in what in identity theory world we would call self-authorship, right? So we're trying to become aware that we're telling our own stories and having a role to play in our own stories. And I understand that that will vary across individuals based on their backgrounds and experiences. In my life, just to come back to what Shannon asked me at the beginning where, um, you know, my own experiences, I suddenly, as you were talking, Ty and Kelly, I had this flashback moment probably over 20 years where I was having a conversation with someone who um, was a near and dear friend, but had not had the same sort of marginalizing experiences that myself and other people that I knew had had. And I was using the analogy of a fan that had ribbons blowing out of it, you know, and those old fashioned fans that they turn around the ribbon comes out. And I remember saying to him, I don't want to be a ribbon. I want to be the fan. And he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and maybe none of you have any idea of what I was talking about. That's another um, t-shirt. Right. <laughs> but just this idea that, you know, can't, how can we help individual children and in my work teachers to see themselves as having that agency mm -hmm. and to reinvent what they're doing and reinvent their practices and in the course of doing that, reinvent themselves. So how important is interdisciplinary process skills, the whole layer of thinking skills, critical thinking, the suite of the verbs that we are instead of the nouns that we might know, how critical is that to maintaining that sense of individualized identity? And then how does that continue from within our incubators and our classrooms and our informal learning environments into the real world and the workplace? That um, when it comes, especially what you said about the interdisciplinary, uh, very, very important because um, we had mentioned this before, how you don't necessarily think as an invention or being an inventor, anything other than you know, creating something that might be STEM wise. So applying that word, uh, to everyday self, like uh, they're saying, everybody is saying, uh, Joanna and, and Ty, um, is, is very crucial because then it carries into other disciplinary, uh, disciplinaries of being able and not being afraid of inventing, 
Um, and so I also believe too, that once that confidence is built, uh, um, like with my adult students, they're able to take that into their everyday lives as well. Um, and because the process that, you know, the mentoring should begin and being able to do a, an engineering design process that can carry through well, to every aspect of life is important because the self-confidence boost. Um, and also too, with, with the mentorship of, of myself looking you know, like my students that it, that it can be done. And so that's why I think the whole diversity and making sure we bring that underrepresented a population forth to not only apply academically, but also in everyday life. Yeah, I mean, so I often tell people both in invention circles and management circles that the art of actually, and I'll put it in the management terms, the art of actually being a good leader is addressing your own issues and getting over yourself so you can show up better for your team. The art of being a good inventor is actually getting over the expert mind and being a novice, right? So the interesting insight I've had from, from working way too long in way too many areas is just like the true quote unquote scientific breakthroughs happen when a specialist from one field comes into a new field and ignores all the assumptions that people that have been experts in that field have assumed for decades. And then voila, something exciting and new happens. So like only when you have that like cross domain cultivation of thoughts and merging of ideas and that only comes when you have you know, people that are courageous enough that have a different perspective that have a different expertise, whether it's math or design or whatever else it is, comes into a, a space and does something that is wow to people in that space, but to them it's a second nature, right? Um, I'll stop there. When I think just to jump in and say that that requires a sense of psychological safety, right? Which came up a few mm -hmm. minutes ago. Can, how do we help children and community members move from one domain to another and even though they feel like novices can they feel psychologically safe to explore now this this issue of being com comfortable with complexity ambiguity and not knowing it's one of the highlight habits of mind that that we talk about as underpinning inventiveness and inventive behavior and as you think about what that looks like and what that feels like, where have each of you experienced that that led to a kind of breakthrough or transition moment? And how do you think we as educators and facilitators can spark that in our students? Um, going piggyback off of what um, Joanna had said is that um, how to you know, create exactly what you're saying. And what came to my mind immediately is also having to do that within yourself. Because even, you know, all of us have been in this game for quite a bit of time. And then um, for me personally, because of my background and still trying to, you know, go forward, I still struggle with that. And so I'm supposed to, as you know, the mentor help project that, um, be open, inclusive, and bringing um, the people like me into this arena. And yet sometimes I still feel inadequate. And it's because it's not talked about enough. I don't see many others in the same situation that um, I am or in the same role that I am in. Starts internally first is, yeah. I think it's very key. Uh, I'm gonna just add to that and say like, even to this day, I still suffer from imposter syndrome, like everywhere I go, every meeting I'm in, every room I'm in. Um, and the interesting thing is you know, if you look at my resume, you'd see, you know, this guy is obviously schizophrenic. Like, you know, he jumped from like Fortune 100 company to government, to consulting, to startups, to nonprofits. And what you don't see behind all of that is the fact that I discovered that I was not the type of person that wanted to actually be in one cog in a money-making like machinery sort of like what Jenna was saying, I wanna be the fan that actually does some good in the world rather than being one of the strings that just get like twirled around. Um, and, and that's how I discovered like, you know, 
what feeds me. So in terms of like for educators, the thing I think that's going to be most important, the thing that I liked that I actually like appreciated was when a teacher like took interest in me and actually found out like what was my passion, like what feeds me, what would I go like very deeply into and understand or want to fix or just like just want to absorb myself into. And once you tap into that for each one of the people that you're, you know, before and teaching, you'd be amazed at what inventive power comes from them. Um, just a real quick in, in, in my world and in, in academe, I mean, I, I have imposter syndrome bringing complexity theory into identity theory and bringing identity theory into complexity, right? It's a, it's a, a two-way uh, uh, street of imposter syndrome in a, in a way, not feeling like you know enough about anything. Um, and yet the work that we do as uh, higher ed faculty, oftentimes we are required to break new ground in terms of theory or method or practice or all three of those. Um, and so I think that if we can sort of use the nested system idea, how can we help, you know, I might be able to do that in my small piece, my corner of the world, but how can I show you through either mentorship or modeling or just bringing you along with me, um, you know, conceptually speaking, how can you see that, that you could also do that? And then you can also go and, and do that in your corner of the world and then inspire other people to do the same thing as well. How can we do that for our children when our educational systems are so subject oriented and siloed and evaluative, you know? I mean, there was a comment in the chat I just saw about high school students having imposter syndrome and how can we help them to feel more empowered to, you know, admit that even experts don't have to know everything about everything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I love- too in, in chat. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, no, go on. I saw that too. And I was like, wow, how powerful is that? The imposter syndrome. And that automatically made me think, it made my heart flutter because I've experienced that myself. And so the two things, especially being a middle school and a, a high school educator, is the imposter syndrome boils down to two things. Either you can't relate because of your background and not being able to relate that mostly white in this, you know, the STEM and invention area. Either you can't relate or you're a fake. I got that a lot mm -hmm. because, you know, of, of where I am and then being called fake by some students because they didn't believe it because they're still in a mindset of that's not able, they cannot achieve anything like that for themselves. And so that imposter syndrome uh, for me, and that's what you were relating in the beginning, Sharon, is having to share my own story and then also being that mentor, carrying on, on and on. And then uh, the, you know, the whole, uh, um, pay it forward and then making sure that they pay it forward too because that is how we overcome it is you have to be genuine and, and, and real with it and if you uh, can't relate because you don't have a similar background we must seek out the ones that do and then that way the students can still see right and then the more that they see the less you have uh, with the you're a fake the you're a fake comes from is because they don't see it I love that I mean the, the importance of mentoring and being seen so you're the example of others yeah. um and i also want to bring out like if it's not obvious to everyone else here like both of you are examples of like why we need cross domain why we need um uh, I, what do you call it it's not intersection but like intermingling of multiple domains and specialities and people from different background like the fact that you're looking at identity and complexity theory, Joanna, just means to me that I'm going to expect a breakthrough from you in that space right. in the next couple of years, right? That's what it tells me. That's what it signals. It's like the fact that you're willing to actually tell your story and be out there as bravely as you are, Kelly, tells me that, you know, you are either going to um, create a movement and, you know, I want, I want a t-shirt, whatever the movement is. <laughs> Or are you going to spark a bunch of, of students that are going to create amazing movements that you're going to be like, you know, board member for? Yeah. So I, <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you both. Sorry. Oh, so I, as, I, as, as, we, as we spiral toward closing out this part of our 
of our session. Um, Joanne, I have a question for you and then I'm gonna do a little lightning round for all of you. And I'll tell you what the prompt is now so you can think about it. And it's, what is the next thing you wanna see on a t-shirt? And my question, Joanna, in, in, in line with this, the thread of discussion we've just been having in, in the model of complexity theory and in nonlinear systems, it's, it's, it's open, it's expansive, it's emergent. And on the other hand, those systems tend to lock in and get rigid around attractor states. And that's true as you shared internally and on a psychological level. And these habits of mind that can be ruts that are hard to get out of, what are some mechanisms you've seen that work internally in the classroom and in cultures and the collective that help us bump from the attractor state into the more expansive set of possibilities? That's a great question, Sharon. Um, so some of our research that my um, colleague Albie Kaplan and I have done, he's at Temple University, um, we have been looking at um, what happens when individuals in classrooms or teachers in professional development settings or individuals in museums um, are prompted in some way or um, you know, triggered or facilitated in some way to generate a meaningful connection between their own lives and the content of what they're being presented with and sort of build that bridge of self-relevance from an identity perspective and not just from a, oh, I also know about Newton's laws, right? It's, well, how is this meaningful to me when I fall off my skateboard, right? It's a very sort of personal and how can I be better at skateboarding knowing something about Newton's laws and be better at physics knowing something about skateboarding, right? Um, so it's that sort of triggering that, um, that peaking the curiosity that comes from the self and then being in a psychologically safe and supported environment to explore what the implications might be for you to change in some way. And also from a complexity uh, perspective, not necessarily being given what the goal is of that identity exploration exercise, right? It's being invited to participate in an exploration exercise and construct for yourself. So the idea is to, it's almost, um, you know, like Maria Montessori's perspective of preparing an environment and inviting individuals to come into it and exploring and offering these affordances in that environment that then mean that they will construct new relationships and understandings for themselves. Mm -hmm. Being I don't comfortable. know if that answers your question, Sharon. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> creating the, those spaces of, of comfort that are the between spaces, those, mm -hmm. those are in the language of, uh, of Vygotsky, uh, the zone of proximal development where we, where we are and are not and are in that space of becoming. So I wanna give each of you a, a last chance to chime in, share the next t-shirt slogan if you'd like, other than there's a t-shirt for that. Um, and then we'll close out and, and let you go on to the rest of your day. It's been a fabulous discussion. So Kelly, would you like to close us out with some final thoughts and, yes, and then Ty and then Joanna? So um, one of the important things I wanted to say, and again, hits on uh, what uh, um, Joanna, uh, Joanna and Ty are saying, the key words that I heard from you, Joanna, is the, you know, the um, safe and secure environment. And I think what's missing in the chain that I would like to bring to everyone's attention is the adult education um, part of this system. So we tend to focus mostly on uh, K through 12 education when it comes to being inventive and uh, having these discussions. Yes, you can do it too. And I think the link that we're missing are the adults who are already here um, because they affect their own household, their own children, the neighborhood children, and so uh, that was one of the reasons why I created um, a first Lego league for adults. And so they can understand the computer programming. So they're more um, willing to participate in their child's and their niece or nephew's affairs when it comes to this big generation that we're now cultivating. Um, so, and when we do this, of course, the confidence level of these adults will arise. I have, for example, I have a 65 year old um, adult black female um, who works at the store, you know, in giant seafood department, who can now code. And so who can now influence her own niece with this and feel great about herself, again, increasing that self-confidence that it can be done within this population. Fabulous. Ty. No, I want to hear what, what uh, Kelly has on her oh. t-shirt. 
What are you putting on your t-shirt? Um, I have about five different t-shirts and sweatshirts that say Steminist. <laughs> okay. Um, perfect. So I'm, I've been thinking about this while Kelly was talking and what comes to me is just like as educators <clears throat> is the responsibilities that you have because you are the ones that are crafting and creating molding delicate little minds right and some you know not delicate older minds uh and the responsibility you have is is one to get over yourself so you can actually show up for your the people that you're educating uh, in an authentic way and provide them with the environment that they need to thrive um Two is to identify and eliminate the assumptions in the material you're presenting or in the curriculum that you have to get through such that it doesn't set up like this deficit thinking and this mindset of there is a bar, I'm way beneath this bar at this point. And finally, you know, how do you remove or change the systems and the processes in place that you know, promote this imposter syndrome, that promotes this uh, recognition, recognition, this internal debate about like not being a part of or in or co-creating this invention system. Um, I think those three things are gonna be you know, my final thoughts. And for the t-shirt, I want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat. I want like all the identities, a word cloud, you know, bald Jamaican, like handy abled. And in the center of it, I want inventor to be big and bold with everything else, all the identities around it. Thanks. Awesome. Joanna, some last thoughts. That's perfect. Um, last thoughts, I guess um, my last thoughts would be just to return to the point that I made earlier about invention, not just being about the invention of a product, but also the invention of the self making that an explicit part of the curriculum would be, you know, that's sort of my pipe dream, right? Um, because the research shows that it doesn't tend to happen spontaneously or without prompting, especially for certain students or certain educators that have um, had certain types of experiences. Um, and so finding ways to make it explicit in the in the curricula that we have and the experiences that we have and not be afraid of it because it can be kind of squishy and intimidating when we think about well now we're going to reflect on our on ourselves you know not everyone's comfortable with that um and so just finding ways to to make that process in and of itself explicit and safe I think would be a, a great outcome. So I was thinking about my the t-shirt um, and I love these ideas for t-shirts um, and I don't know if this is a phrase in America as well as in the UK. I grew up in the UK but um, saying necessity is the mother of invention and so I would have identity exploration is the mother of invention on my t-shirt. Fabulous. That's a wonderful, wonderful way to close this out. I want to acknowledge and honor grace and gratitude to all of you. We're, we're so inspired by your stories. And this is not the end of the discussion. It's just another point in our continued exploration. So thank you so much. We're going to let our panelists head off. And we're going to transition here. I'm going to welcome my Lemelson Center colleague, Emma Gron. Emma is a museum program specialist for our Draper Spark Lab. She's our operations manager. She helps train and support all of our volunteers. She manages our facilitators. She is an educator in her own right, participating in professional development workshops. She graduated from Bucknell University with a degree in history and political science and has a master's in museum studies from George Washington University. And I welcome you, Emma, here today as my colleague and also my guest. I want to probe for what came out for you as you listened to the discussion we just had. And as you think about what happens every day in Spark Lab at our site, in the Spark Labs around our network, and the kind of shifts and transformations of identity making or identity revelation that happen for our visitors. Just share, share your, your impressions, your thoughts, and what's stuck with you. Yeah, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, everybody, for having me here. Um, one of the things that I think really jumped out to me about this conversation was the theme and the through line of fear. 
Um, and I think it's really interesting because I think fear and being inventive go hand in hand. And I don't know exactly how it works, um, but somebody who studies evolution might be able to explain it to me. But I sort of almost think like our bodies have been hardwired over time to be uncomfortable with uncertainty. And, um, and I think everybody touched on that as a, a challenge for sort of becoming inventive and finding that um, new uh, mindset. Um, but I think for me, one of the things that Spark Lab does um, is it provides a place where it's okay to be afraid because there's a support structure there built in and baked in and it's easy enough and accessible enough that it's not too scary. Um, so sort of that sort of structure around it makes it a little bit easier to be afraid. Um, so it's a little bit easier to grapple with that uncertainty. That was one thing I kind of kept coming back to was like, you know, fear is actually not a bad thing here for us when we're inventing. It's a good thing. And the only fearless people I've ever met are like really reckless three-year-olds, I think. Um, and so it's maybe more that it's um, good to be afraid, but we still have to be brave about it um, when we're inventing and um, sort of as adults in the equation can help support that bravery in the inventor. One of the observations I would share um, along those lines um, and curious to hear your further thoughts on this is the space and the cues and the facilitation around being inventive is unstructured in the sense that there are many, many paths to success and many, many right answers. How important is that to navigating that shift that Joanna was talking about from the stuck perspective of who we think we might be into the more expansive unknown of who we might become? I think, um, I think it's essential. I mean, I think in Spark Lab, we have sort of a whole set of activities. And one of the things they all have in common is that they have, they're sort of small in scope, so they're manageable, but they're all very open-ended and there's a million ways you can succeed. And it means there's a million ways that you can approach it, but it also means that anybody can approach it with what they know and what they think and what they're interested in. and play and have fun and sort of use those simple materials to practice. Um, Cause I think that's the, for me, it's sort of that practice element um, that being open-ended and being, um, having all those paths means you can practice down one path and then you can come back to the center and try again and come back to the center and go down a new path. Um, and that, you know, a mindset shift takes practice and you kind of have to, um, show up and flex those muscles to get there. Hmm. And uh, one of the layers of expertise you bring to the work you do is to, it's a recursive effect, which is to be inventive about supporting facilitators and volunteers in helping others be inventive. Can you say a little about how those very practices scale up to coaching, mentoring, and facilitating the art of facilitating inventiveness. It's the little net, the nested frames that we're all in. Yes, I think one of the things that's so fun about what we get to do is that um, element that we um, are helping people make and reshape their own identities as facilitators um, and as um, people who are encouraging inventiveness by forcing them to be the inventor themselves. They, they also, alongside the learner, are reacting to what is happening and they are responding. Um, and I think it's that practicing uh, flexibility that allows for the guidance and the encouragement um, to kind of bubble up naturally and be, as um, our wonderful panelists just said, um, sort of um, safe and comfortable to do that. Mm, and 
how do you know when it's working? How does that show up? And I've heard, I'll quote a colleague of ours, Tim Pula, our resident inventor who helps create our Spark Lab activities. And Tim has said, he knows when a visitor is about to do something inventive by the sparkle in their eye. So on that level of what we see, what we can observe, how do you know when that's happening? Excuse me. It's one of the best parts of what we do because I think, and it shows up in so many different ways. Sometimes it's that sparkle that you really can, you can just sort of watch somebody when they're right on the verge of um, kind of putting the pieces together and making, making something new and different. But it's watching um, and watching the process from sort of curiosity to confidence that can be so joyful. Um, but I think too, for me, I hear it in the way people um, change their framing between when they arrive and when they leave. Sometimes we get people and you can sort of see that they're a little nervous because it's scary, because it's uncomfortable um, and because they're not sure what's going on. And they try one thing and they kind of get in there and they maybe they sit down, maybe they call somebody over. Um, and then we get to layer on that sort of guidance and encouragement with the facilitation practice in the space. And you can start to ask them questions. And we use the language of invention and an inventive mindset when we're framing our questions and you can hear them not totally comfortable with that um, when we first start out. They don't totally know what that means. And then by the time they leave, they are sort of parroting and using the same language we used as uh, facilitators. So um, they may say, look at this thing I made when they first talk to you. And when you see them again in 10 minutes, they've said, look at my invention. And so you can sort of chart the progress of the way they're shifting the thinking around what they're making and doing. That's awesome. Thank you. So well said. And I couldn't have scripted a better response, which we didn't, to the first wave of the breakout groups that Emma and I would like to facilitate. So with thanks, we're going to turn to the more participatory interactive part. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion and our after discussion. We want to continue this through line that came up in the panel around inventive identity beginning within, but scaffolding beyond and outside. And especially in the context of the work that we are part of, the first question we want to pose, and we'll send this out to the breakout groups, but just so you can begin percolating, what's something you heard today that resonates with you and your own experience? And in what ways are you currently building and expanding your own identity? And then we'll loop back and convene for a few more minutes and then we'll extend that into, a, a, into another breakout question. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Aaron, Gina and Corey to disperse us into breakouts. And Sharon, how long would you like everybody to stay in a breakout room? Oh, we're gonna do the breakout for 10 minutes. Perfect. Great, Gina's getting us set up right now and we will be Zooming off shortly. Welcome back. I see the participant number spiraling up. I'll give it another few seconds for everyone to join back. Great. So we hope you had some really evocative and reflective discussions. Um, Emma and I want to invite you to hold a thought or two from the discussion you just had, craft that, and then on the count of three, we're gonna ask you to do a chat storm and fill the chat with what came up. Could be a word, a phrase, a question, a thought, and we'll just let that flow for a few minutes. Um, and then we're gonna turn around and we'll give you a second prompt to build on that first prompt. So one, two, three. Great, I see agency, passion. Invention takes practice, embracing failure, create a space of trust, allow failure to come center stage. We need to combat imposter syndrome, 
Imposter is novice. Inventing identities is important in syncing with external practice. Ha, ah, relationships take time. Walk with others, parents, choice. Ah, affordability. These are wonderful thoughts. Seeing this interesting through line of the importance of the grown-ups, getting buy-in from the grown-ups is a, a really key part of this too, which is really exciting to see. Yeah, and in the in this kind of part of the nonlinear system dynamics way of looking at things, we are each other's other. We're the other that can spark and we're we're in it. Um, as we were talking about earlier, we're both in it and we're creating it together. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So, any last chat storm additions? So, we're gonna branch off into another round of breakout discussions. We'll be do a random mix. And our question prompt for the next 10 minutes is a little more action oriented. And the question we want you to ponder and talk about is what's an action you want to take to help your students or your wider community to expand their sense of inventive identity? And what does that look like for you? Hi everyone, welcome back. Hi everyone, I hope you had some great discussions. And I hope, mm -hmm. Emma and I hope that the first breakout discussion would actually seed some thoughts and ideas and outcomes and visions for the second breakout. So we're going to do another chat storm. And so I'd ask you again to hold a thought, a word, a phrase, uh, one or two things that stood out from the discussion you just had. And then on the count of three, we'll fill the chat, do a nice chat fall and reflect a little bit together before we close out and move on to today's breakout sessions. So one, two, Three, turn on the chat. Wow. Compassionate challenge. Again, the parents as an important part of the equation, starting young, huh, there's less to undo. Starting with passion rather than problems. That's a t-shirt. Parent engagement, sharing books and resources on black inventors, empathy, vulnerability. Again, that theme of being open to not knowing, sharing and building vulnerability together. Opportunity to impact virtually. Role models in unexpected areas. That's some of what Kelly and Ty and Joanna were talking about as well the vocabulary we use. That would be interesting to drill down on, hear a little more about that. Safe environments, starting with passion. Training teachers to be culturally responsive and being deliberate with words. Interesting theme around language and the words we use. Um, I hope that will come up in some of our other breakouts. Emma, as you're scanning the chat, what are you seeing jump out? What's clicking for you now? There's an, a lot of empathy, some of it is, that was really what somebody said, but there's a lot of empathy baked into these responses that I think are really, um, really beautiful to be able to um, think about the young inventor or the inventor of any age really, but also then to sort of carry that mantle with us as we um, think about how we wanna spark that in other people. Yeah, exactly, wonderful. So many prompts. I have to say this is one of the most savable chats that I've had in Zoom in a long time. So we wanna thank you so much for being with us for the panel discussion, for our after reflections, and then for your thoughtful and generative work in the breakout sessions. And as we pivot and close out this portion of the program, um, we'd like to ask you to hold in your mind something about what you envisioned as an action and use that as a through line for the rest of today's convening, maybe in making the choice for which breakout to attend. And also um, I'd encourage you to find 
something someone said in the chat that clicks for you, connect with that person and plan a coffee break after the convening. And in that way, the network can be a, a true uh, spark for continued connection and collaboration, which is ultimately, as we heard from all of our panelists, that's how the, the only way that work can be done is in community and in our shared questions. So with that, I say thank you. Thank you, Emma, for joining. And uh, thank you to the Lemelson Foundation for inviting us to host this panel. And I'm going to toss it back to Corey. Thank you all so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sharon and Emma. And huge thanks to Ty, Kelly, and Joanna for their panel discussion today. Um, it really was an extraordinary way to start the day um, and, um, and expand our minds around um, all of the interconnectedness of the, the work that is happening right now um, and all of the um, human elements um, in identity that, um, that begin to um, transform that. So huge thanks and thanks to the whole group for the breakout sessions. I had the chance to sit in on one and it was just really exciting to see folks grapple with those questions and start to think about what this work means to them in their daily work and lives. So um, with this session, we will be closing out our plenary session and we um, will be moving into breakouts. Um, again, a huge um, uh, pitch to join those breakout sessions. Um, as we go forward, um, they are really, really fantastic. And one thing that, um, that Sharon and I were talking about while we were waiting for folks to come back around is how might you be able to bring the thought or action idea that you had in the last um, small group discussion, how could you bring that into the breakout session that you're gonna be joining um, in just a few short minutes? So would encourage you to think about that as well. Um, before we um, send folks off into those breakout sessions, I would like to hand it over to um, Aaron and David for some final remarks and housekeeping before, um, before we whisk you away into your groups. Uh, so really, you know, I just want to say thank you to everyone for, for being here and for the active participation. And I have learned so much over the last um, almost three days now, and it's it's sort of it went really fast, <laughs> um, and it's hard to believe that you know it's it's almost over. But you know, I might sort of emphasize that we don't want the conversations to end here. We do want to move toward action, and so we're really just sort of at the beginning. And how do we continue um, moving in that direction? Um, you know, I'd like to sort of quickly refer back to uh, a slide that I shared at the very beginning. Um, which is the vision and the, the values for, for Invent Ed. And the reason I wanna share this is um, in the network priorities conversation we had yesterday, there were you know, several comments from folks saying, you know, we really need to sort of think about what are, what are our values um, that we bring to the table as we think about priorities and how we engage and, and um, you know, build a field in invention education. And so, um, you know, these, these statements are not finalized. And if you have, as you're looking at them, if you have thoughts and suggestions and feedback for us, I really, we would really love to hear it. Um, and so Gina has posted in the chat um, where you can go and put comments on the vision and the values. If you think something's missing, if it's not the right words, um, this really is a reflection of, of all of you um, and doesn't just come from like a few of us. So thank you, we really appreciate your, your thoughts. Um, and then, you know, just to sort of, in, in thinking about sort of next actions, um, there's been a lot of sort of takeaways. Um, and so I might just sort of call out, you know, if you were in Reagan Price's um, session after Dr. McGee on Tuesday, uh, she asked everyone to find an accountability partner to continue that work around equity and, and justice. And so I would definitely encourage you to find an accountability partner. I'm looking for an accountability partner. I would love to be an accountability partner with anyone. So um, I think you all have my email by now. So definitely um, reach out. I'll be reaching out to folks as well. Um, and then, you know, from our network parties conversation yesterday, thank you so much to everyone who 
uh, signed up on the volunteer sheet to continue those conversations and to really figure out uh, where we go with those priorities for, for the network. Um, and we'll be, we'll be having follow-up conversations on those. And then finally, as Corey just sort of mentioned, um, continuing the personal work on inventive identity, the amazing panel discussion and breakouts that we just had with, with Sharon and, and her team um, to think about how, what you envision as an action um, and to connect with others to continue the conversation. Um, so, you know, I might just end with uh, a little bit more on the action grants. So those are the RFP for the action grants is going to be coming out in about a month from now. And I mentioned yesterday during the network priorities, they really, we really want them to be a reflection of um, what all of you see as priorities for this network. And so I hope that over the last few days, you've had the opportunity to connect with others and to engage in conversations that sparking ideas for you and potential connections for those action grants. Um, and I'll be you know, teasing out a little bit more information as we start to open up that RFP. Um, but I hope you're, you're feeling excited about some of the work that you're already doing and hopefully some new work that you might be interested in taking on and finding partners. Um, so I'll leave it there. And just to say, you know, truly from the bottom of my heart, like thank you all for showing up and for being so engaged and so committed. Um, and like I said at the top, this is a uniquely inspiring community and it's, it's a privilege to be here. So thanks. Over to you, David. <laughs> yeah, I can't say it enough how this network is fueled by your passion and I'm, I'm just excited to see you know folks keep coming back every year and you bringing new folks to this conversation because without that spark that inspiration we're not going to be able to accomplish the goals we want and I think that you know for those who've been around for a while when you look back and for when I look forward is I get excited about what happens when we're able to put our logos aside and we put kids first. And we really think about how do we work together to solve problems? Let's, let's take convention and use it. Find the problems, identify it, get the right people in the room, create a team, and actually let's get to it. Um, so I think, you know, I always say these, these, this, we, there's an intentionality around calling it a convening versus a conference, because I feel at a conference, you sit back, you listen, and you walk away, and you take a nugget or two. But with a convening, it's around problem solving pulling people together. So I hope that people come together. I know I see, I'm looking at my list here on Padlet around equity and justice and others I signed up and I see some accountability friends that I'm looking forward to working with around um, equity and justice. I wanna thank our planning committee um, for putting all their effort and time into thinking through the vision of what we were trying to accomplish. We had so many breakout session leaders, um, that put effort and time and energy into creating good content, our network spotlight contributors who work year round and really shared their story around, again, putting their logos aside, putting their organizations and talent together to figure out how to solve a problem together. To all the facilitators and the moderators, the full group to their contributions. There's so many people to thank because it's built, this community is built by people. I wanna make sure I thank the team that I get to work with behind the scenes, Aaron Toshin, Corey Frazier, Gina Carter, and all the other folks at Uncommon who are behind the scenes for helping to put together a vision and driving it forward so that we can walk away feeling inspired, but hopefully inspired towards action. And so I will leave you with that, that this is not a goodbye because we have more work to do, which is, I hope you will join the breakout sessions immediately Fall. I know Corey is gonna say, you're gonna have a break, so take that break, but come back. We have put, folks who have put a lot of time and effort, and so we hope you'll come and listen and see what other problems you might be willing to connect on and solve. On social media, please keep the conversation going as well. We want other people to know about this community only because we want them to join, to be bring their voice each year, each of you brings a valuable contribution and that diversity and that perspective is important to invention in our innovation in our work. So thank you again. I look forward to seeing you in a breakout in a little short while. Great. Thank you, David. Um, it really is such an honor to get to be with you each year. Um, and this year was an extraordinary one. Um, so thank you all too for being so flexible and being willing to learn some new technology and, um, and just dive in. I feel like we are all Zoom and virtual meeting pros at this point, but 
it's kind of a beautiful thing when you get to see a community that you've known for a while um, come to life on this platform. Um, and it was fantastic to see so many new folks. So with this, um, your last job is to go and benefit from some of the extraordinary brain power and experience that your colleagues bring to you. So um, Gina is going to share a slide that'll show you the topics for our final round of breakout sessions. Um, and I think you'll find that this is a really terrific um, group of sessions. In it, we've got um, Design Squad, which is really looking at how can we empower students to make change in their communities. Free PD training, we heard a lot about how can we support educators um, in this work that we're doing. And we're so grateful that Jill and Joanna are um, gonna be sharing that with us in their breakout session. Um, we've got a great session on the maker mindset and a case study with the DOD and STEM ecosystems. Um, the incredible work of the invention portfolio um, that's been happening with Leslie Flynn and Chelsea on engaging learners and assessing competencies. And then finally, the role of incubators in invention education. So um, you, David said you had a break. You get a, like a tiny, tiny break. Uh, stretch your legs, pretend like you're walking from the main conference room to a breakout room, grab another glass of water, um, but um, make your way to the links that Gina has posted in the chat. So thanks again, everybody, and hope to see you in real life next year. Bye.